Good afternoon. Uh, good morning, I should say, uh, everybody. And I'm really delighted uh, to be with you all. And I want to especially recognize our CJCC for organizing, reaching out, and planning a robust discussion for us. So I want to acknowledge Manon and the entire staff at the CJCC. Give them a big round of applause. Thank you very much. Uh, and I am always heartened when I see people from around our region uh, talking about issues that affect us all. Uh, you may know that I really, I told everybody, uh, if I became mayor, I would be the most regional mayor in the history of the District of Columbia. Uh, because we know that so many issues that affect us from health issues and public safety issues, issues uh, related to, to public health and the air and traffic, you name it. Uh, they don't know political boundaries, do they? Uh, and so it's so important that we all work together on uh, these major issues that affect the quality of life in our region, um, and the health of our residents, the safety of our residents, and all of those issues are also bottom line economic issues, um, because if we can't have those things in line and together, the economic development potential and job creation potential of our region uh, is most negatively affected. I tell everybody, all of these things lead to us being able to have the resources to provide an uh, incredible quality of life for the people of the District of Columbia uh, in this region. Uh, so we all know, and I know that the CJCC and certainly um, the district government, uh, and even prior to my time has, as mayor has had a focus on synthetic drugs. Uh, we know that they are highly dangerous and represent a serious uh, threat uh, to public health and uh, to public safety. Uh, so the issue of synthetic drugs certainly has our full attention. So let me tell you uh, a few things that we are focused on in uh, the district as it relates to synthetic drugs. Uh, first, I want to recognize all of our partners, um, our federal partners who are so focus uh, with our police department and with our public health apparatus on making sure uh, that we're not only dealing with prevention issues, um, but we're also dealing with investigative and enforcement issues. And so we are very thankful um, to all of our partners. I also want to recognize all of the people in, in my government uh, who have come together to make sure we're uh, dealing with the issues of synthetic drugs. Um, and the it's, it's varied. It's across our regulatory agencies, our mental health and substance abuse uh, agency, uh, as well as our, our crime lab, uh, and unfortunately, uh, our medical examiner's office. So when we put all of our pieces uh, together, we, uh, we can develop a clear picture of what's happening on our streets uh, and in our hospitals. And I neglected to mention another partner, and that's our fire and emergency medical service, which is really catching um, the brunt of problems um, related to synthetic drug use. So I want to acknowledge my director of DCRA, our consumer regulatory agency, Melinda Bowling, is, who is here. Uh, our chief medical examiner, Dr. Roger Mitchell, who is here. Our crime lab director, or also known as the director of forensic sciences, Dr. Smith is here. Where is Dr. Smith? Uh, and our uh, director of the, the Department of Behavioral Health, which deals with both mental health and substance abuse, uh, Dr. Royster, who I saw, who is here. So uh, er earlier in the summer, uh, we announced, and I will tell you, I get so many comments from the people of the District of Columbia about a law uh, we announced. And it was really that reaction from everyday people across all eight wards of the District of Columbia who made it perfectly clear to me that we not only had a problem, but we had a growing problem that was simmering. Uh, we announced a, a zero tolerance policy for um, 
for retailers who sell synthetic drugs. Um, and so not three strikes, but two strikes. Um, very serious fine uh, for our first uh, uh, occurrence of selling synthetic drugs. And the second, another significant fine, but also the, the DCRA, Ms. Uh, Ms. Bowling's office, would seek to revoke the business license. Uh, so we pushed that out uh, heavily in June. Actually, I think the Council of the District of Columbia will be considering uh, today and moving forward to permanent legislation as it relates to um, synthetic drugs in our retailers. And Ms. Bowling can tell you more and more about uh, how her office is working with the Metropolitan Police Department on investigations. And we're also seeking um, all the time. And just when I was just out yesterday, somebody told me about a retailer that they knew were selling synthetic drugs under the table. That's why it was so important um, that the, the MPD and our federal partners followed and were able uh, uh, to have one of the most uh, significant synthetic drug busts in the history of the District of Columbia. Uh, they uh, found 260 pounds of synthetic drugs and more than 19,000 packages small packages of the drug Bizarro. Uh, we believe that their value, their street value was $2.3 million. Uh, so the investigation found that these drugs were being delivered uh, to a storage unit uh, in the district on their way to retailers in the streets of, of of our city. Um, and so this uh, focus on finding the distribution point, stopping them um, and prosecuting people that would have these drugs on our streets is a significant part of our strategy. We uh, also uh, know that education is, is key, and we're looking for all kinds of ways to educate um, people in the District of Columbia. Sometimes we think that all of these issues start with the young people. Um, and it's true that young people are exposed, but it's not just the young people. And um, as I come across uh, more and more instances of K2 use, they're not juveniles. Um, they are definitely adults, but we want to attack it uh, with a public service campaign across all of our, our media to get the word out about how dangerous this drug is, um, the, the very um, weird effects that it has on people. Uh, and we have also gotten away. You will hear many people call this synthetic, what? Marijuana. Um, and we have to make it clear that these drugs are nothing like marijuana. Um, and they do have the effect of making people like zombies with very uh, unpredictable behavior. Uh, so part of what the Department of Health is doing is launching a public service campaign, um, which we will make sure we have robust um, resources to support getting it out far and wide called Don't Be a K2 Zombie. Um, and we have to press the message, uh, especially uh, in the district and in the surrounding areas where uh, the, the move has been to decriminalize or legalize, in our case, small amounts of marijuana possession. We don't want any of the young people to get confused. K2 is not marijuana. Um, and we want to make sure that that message is out uh, far and wide. Now, you heard me mention our fire and emergency medical service um, because one of the biggest and most notable, noticeable acute strains uh, on our system caused by K2 use is, is on the fire department. Uh, we began to track over, over, over the summer the number of calls, um, especially that were going uh, to one of our um, homeless services agencies, where one of our homeless shelters, the number of K2 cases. Um, that over and over our fire department, we're pulling ambulances off the street to address K2 use, taking these ambulances to, to our hospitals, again, putting a strain on our, on our emergency rooms and leaving our ambulances there while, while patients are, are being um, passed off to the hospital staff. A huge, a tremendous uh, strain on our fire and emergency medical services. So we wanted to make sure that we had some surveillance. One thing about uh, K2 and the, the rise of synthetic drug use is that uh, actually the, all of us have to catch up with the 
the users and the sellers um, to be able to test for K2 and to be able to track its use. So you hear a lot of anecdotal um, connections between K2 and this crime or K2 in fire and emergency uh, medical service or K2 on what's happening uh, with some of our probationers or parolees or pre-trial uh, folks. So we want to be able to have the science and the testing match what we think um, is happening um, with K2. So in fact, uh, yesterday I, I announced that we would be funding with the chief medical officer and our crime lab uh, technicians that can help us on our end test. Uh, we know that our pretrial services division, I think they may uh, be represented here today, is also testing. Uh, we've encouraged the attorney general to make sure that there is a national focus on, on testing as well so that we know what exactly is going on uh, with, with K2 use. Uh, we've already started a surveillance program at our hospitals where the, ho the, where it's the chief medical examiner and hospital staff uh, collect uh, samples uh, and test for synthetic cannab cannabinoids. I'll get, I'll get that one of these days. Hopefully, I I'll, won't I'll, I'll have to think about it at some point. So far, let me just give you a sample. Uh, we have found that um, those uh, samples tested, 79% were positive uh, for synthetic drugs. But even with this information, we recognize uh, that we have a long way to go. Uh, so every day, uh, we're finding vulnerable citizens taking these drugs. And it was interesting. Uh, Yes, yesterday or a couple days ago, I, I visited our DC jail um, where we have a pilot unit, if you will. We have some good news at the DC jail and that we're using less and less space there. Uh, and so what we are working on is a unit there that it no longer has inmates. Uh, we have set aside um, for uh, inmates who are scheduled to be released uh, within six weeks. And there they are practicing life skills, working and um, all of the things related to being prepared uh, to work. And one of the inmates come, came up to me and was telling me how well he was doing in the program. But then he showed me his picture of when he entered the jail, um, when he was actively using K2. And he says, look at where I've come from and where I'm going. So he recognized uh, certainly what K2 had done in his life. And I got a firsthand account of not only what it made him look like, but how it made him act. Uh, and so just, just recognize that these are real people, real families being devastated um, by K2. Uh, and we have to get the word out. This is not marijuana. This will kill you. This is not marijuana. This makes you act in very bizarre ways. This is not marijuana. We don't want you to be uh, involved in a crime, violent crime, uh, that can change the course of your entire life. So we're gonna do the public education, we're gonna do the testing, we're gonna do the enforcement, uh, and all we all can do uh, is make sure that we're finding gaps in our system um, and filling those gaps. And this regional approach um, is a very important step uh, in doing exactly that. So I wanna thank you for, for your work here today. I know Manon and our entire staff at the CJCC, and of course the entire staff of the district government uh, stands ready to hear your recommendations and put them in place. Thank you very much. I am pleased to invite Director Cliff Keenan to the, the podium again, our, uh, the Director of Pretrial Services and our, our Chair of the Synthetic Drugs Work Group. Thanks. Uh, good morning, everybody, and again, uh, thank you for attending, um, both on behalf of the Pretrial Services Agency and on behalf of the CJCC Synthetic Work Group, I do welcome you as well. Um, I don't like starting off with statistics, but I do think it's important for me to do so to sort of lay a foundation. The Pretrial Service Agency, for those who don't know, is a federal law enforcement agency. Our primary role is to assist the court in making appropriate release and detention decisions, and then to supervise those persons who have been released pending their trial. What we found back in the early 80s was a correlation between drug use and criminal activity was something we should pay attention to. So back in 1984, actually, the Department of Justice gave us funding in order to set up a drug testing laboratory. Interestingly enough, 
uh, for those who may have been here back in the 70s, um, our drugs of choice were primarily mar uh, marijuana and heroin. Um, as we moved into the 80s, we saw PCP, and these handouts I know are very hard to see, so you all have them in your packet on the left-hand side behind the introductory material. So if you can't see it here, it's in your packet. Our drug of choice from the mid-80s um, into uh, the early 90s was actually PCP. In 1987, you could see that 43% of those arrestees testing positive were positive for PCP. Our overall positive rate for arrestees at that point in time was between 70 and 80%. Very, very high. Um, as you can see, moving into the 1990s, crack cocaine became the drug of choice, and cocaine continued to be our drug of choice all the way until recently. Um, the second chart you see there shows our drug trends from 1994 through 2014. Any positive at the beginning of that era was about 48, 49%. Over the last few years, we've been operating under 30%. But again, our drug of choice continues to be cocaine. Opiates and PCP have leveled off. They've always been the same. Amphetamines, unlike other jurisdictions, we don't see it that much here in our DC criminal justice population. The third chart shows the trend is continuing. For the last 12 months, we are operating at about 25%, maybe 24% of all arrestees are testing positive, and again, cocaine continues to be there. So I would suggest that means we've won the war on drugs. Isn't that right? Of course not. Because what are we seeing? Something else is coming into play, and it's something we're trying to get a better handle on. The fourth chart shows that we have been doing some limited synthetic cannabinoid testing within the pretrial service agency for the last few years. What I've given you here is a snapshot for August of this year. We were only able to test each month about 100 to 200 samples because it's very complicated testing. We need to be figuring out better ways of doing that. And our, at our 10 o'clock uh, panel discussion, we're going to be getting into what we're planning to do. But as you can see, of the 200 or so samples that we tested in August, 50%, well, actually 49% were positive for a synthetic, but only for the synthetics that we're able to identify as being those commonly used today. Back in November of 2013, when we started on this, you know, the, the synthetic of choice was UR-144. As you could see, as it goes along, you know, the substances continue to change, you know, almost month to month to month. And that's something that we're hoping to hear from DEA and ONDCP in terms of some of the efforts to, you know, to stay abreast of some of these changes. But most significantly, uh, we've been hearing about the spike in violent crime, the spike in homicides, not just in DC, but around the country. So we at pretrial services did a limited test uh, from July 6th through July 24th of this year. Every person arrested for a violent crime in DC who was willing to give us a urine specimen, because we do ask every arrestee, and surprisingly, between 75 and 85% of the arrestees do voluntarily give us a urine specimen for us to test. We tested those. Out of the 136 samples that were collected, 70% were positive for some drug. 70% were positive for some drug. Clearly, marijuana, 49%, was the drug of choice, but close, well, not close behind, but what was second? Synthetic cannabinoids. As you can see there, 20% of the population arrested for a violent crime tested positive for one of the synthetics. Uh, PCP, the positive rate was only 13%. Cocaine, it was 13%. Opiates, 7%. <coughs> Something is there. What conclusions can we draw from this? I leave that to you. I leave it to us. I leave it to this uh, notion of trying to be um, demanding more vigilance in the DMV, or DMV in the DMV, as we would like to say. We need to pay attention to this. And on behalf of the CJCC Th Synthetic Work Group, you know, I look forward to working with all of you. And I would ask our Maryland and Virginia partners to consider joining the CJCC Work Group so that we could stay on top of the sharing of information that we hope to begin here today. Again, I'll be here over the course of the day. If you have any questions or suggestions about the data that we're collecting, you know, I would be happy to answer it. Again, I commend the work that our Office of Forensic Toxicology Services within the Pretrial Services Agency has been doing for the last, gosh, 32 years. Um, again, it's important work. It's very dynamic work. But again, we can't do it alone, so we look forward to working with each and every one of you. Thank you very much.
And this first panel is going to focus on the federal efforts to reduce the use of new synthetic psychoactive substances. We're pleased to have Christine Cortes, Cortes uh, the Senior Policy Analyst, the Office of the National, of, of National Drug Control Policy, and also Special Agent John Sherbinsky, who is the Executive Director to the the executive assistant to the deputy assistant administrator uh, of the Office of the Diversion Control for the uh, DEA. Please join us. Good morning. Um, I, I really appreciate the chance to be with you today to give you an overview of federal efforts around synthetic drugs and in particular new psychoactive substances. As you know, I'm joined by my colleague John Sherbensky. We're gonna give you a brief overview of um, the federal efforts around new um, psychoactive substances. I'm gonna do what they are. Basically, I know that in um, earlier symposium, you've gone over this, but I thought it would be helpful to just sort of lay the groundwork uh, one more time. Um, talk about why they're dangerous, what we know about use, and describe some of the work we're doing towards reducing use and availability. John, quite frankly, is gonna cover the lion's share of the work that we're doing around reducing availability, reducing supply. Uh, I'm also gonna be here for the day, and I really look forward to hearing, um, as we work through the agenda, the challenges that you guys are facing at the, at the state and the local level, and what we, at the federal level, can do to support your efforts and, and intervention points along the way where we can collaborate more effectively together. So just uh, wanted to start off um, very quickly to tell you who I am and what my agency does, for those of you who are not familiar with our work. We're the Office of National Drug Control Policy. We actually are a small office. We work out of the Executive Office of the President. We develop and guide um, U.S. efforts to reduce drug use and its consequences, and we do it primarily by developing the national drug control strategy and the and national drug control budget. And that's significant because through those two documents, um, we are able to guide the priorities of the federal drug control agencies in the United States and their resources. Um, and so in, in, in a sense, we're setting the priority for the national, for national drug control efforts. Our mission is to foster healthy and safe communities by reducing drug use and its consequences, and we were established by an act of Congress back in 1988. Okay, so a moment about language. Um, in my remarks, I'm not gonna talk about synthetic drugs, I'm gonna talk about new psychoactive substances, and I'm doing that for a reason. Synthetic drugs are a broad category of drugs. I mean, basically, as we know, they're just, they're in comparison to organic, to, to plants, to, to marijuana, for example. Um, and, and so to be more sort of precise, I wanna talk about new psychoactive substances because within synthetic drugs themselves, we have a number of different categories. We have medications that have been approved, that are safe and effective and have been approved by the FDA uh, to, to address medical conditions. We have a, a whole host of synthetic drugs that are, um, that are um, that are designed uh, not to be helpful, but to ha produce some sort of psychoactive, psychotropic effect. Um, those are the ones that we're gonna be talking about, but buried in those are, are these new psychoactive substances, which really are a little different than some of the other synthetic drugs, illicit drugs that we, that we um, more traditionally have discussed, like methamphetamine and ecstasy. Um, okay, so we're gonna be talking about, I'm gonna be talking about NPS and just as a sort of refresher, within, buried within the NPS kind of categories, we have, we have the cannabinoid synthetics, we have the stimulant synthetics, we've got the hallucinogens, and we have the opioids, and these are some of the uh, sort of street names that they, that they go by. This is not a homegrown problem. The vast majority of these substances are being manufactured and synthesized in China. And that's, that's significant in terms of where, where we at the federal level are placing an, uh, uh, um, a lot of our efforts. Uh, they are sold online and they are available in stores in the United States and John's gonna talk a little bit about the whys and, and what we're doing to kind of help uh, ameliorate that. They're marketed, as you know, uh, not for human consumption or for novelty use on the packaging. And, and that's to, to um, evade or, or get around um, laws that we have in the United States, tools, frankly, that we have in the United States to deal with illicit drug use and reduce their availability. Um, and they, as you all know, are targeting in particular young people. They're typically uh, described by suppliers as safe or legal alternatives to traditional illicit drugs. And I, I wanna pause here for a moment and say, 
that among all of the things that I say uh, today, I really would like to drive home two points um, in terms of, of what we can do uh, significantly without very many resources to address this problem. And one of them is this, this, this idea that they are somehow similar or safe alternatives to the more traditional street drugs is something that we, is a myth that we have to work very, very hard to dispel um, among potential users. Um, I also wanted to note that um, I, I mentioned that, that these substances are coming mostly from China, some from India as well, um, but it's also important to note that that this is not just not a homegrown problem in the sense that we're not kind of producing or manufacturing this typically in the United States. Uh, it's also not a problem that the United States is, is, um, is addressing or has to address alone. This is a problem that's plaguing literally the world. Um, we have the United Kingdom, we have Australia, we have New Zealand. We're, we're joined, um, unfortunately, by a very large number of countries who have been having challenges with new psychoactive substances for quite some time. And, and this is a bad thing, obviously. Uh, we None of us want to have to deal with this. But on the other hand, it's a very good thing because it is it, this issue has taken center stage among the drug policy discussions that are, that are being had in international forum uh, like the United Nations and regional forum um, here in our hemisphere. Uh, as a matter of fact, we have coming up in April 2016 a fairly significant opportunity uh, to take a look uh, globally together as a community about the way that we address uh, the global drug problem and how we are reducing um, access and availability of, of these drugs in our communities. And one of the top agenda items that's been um, decided upon, so there's going to consensus reach, is, is around new psychoactive substances. And there's a lot of efforts that are being undertaken at the international level, and John's going to talk about some of them that are truly significant in terms of uh, down the road reducing the availability of these substances here in the United States. But I just really wanted to, to say, and this is a very good thing, uh, that, that it is an issue that we're all grappling with and it's one that we're all working on together. Okay, so, um, so speaking of internationally, uh, the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime, which is housed in Vienna, Austria, has a division that's dedicated solely to synthetic drugs, and, and in there are amphetamine-type stimulants and these new psychoactive substances. And they have a framework for tracking and monitoring and identifying uh, these different sorts of substances. And as of 2013, they had identified 348 distinct new psychoactive substances um, they have a report that's going to be coming out soon that will give information um, for 2014, but we already know from their system informally that, that as of 2015, and we're in September 2015, so we haven't even reached the end of the calendar year, they've identified on top of the 348 an additional 200 new substances. So this is significant in terms of uh, the, the scope of the problem that we're all trying to grapple with. Um, I want to now turn for a moment to use rates, which were discussed sort of briefly earlier, and I wanted to start uh, by talking a little bit about the challenges um, that we all have around uh, use rates. It's really important for us at the federal level, as it is for you at the state and, and, and municipal level and in communities, to get a handle on use rates, because without the, that data, without knowing uh, how many people are using, who is using, what populations are using, how, how, literally how people are using, what modes of ingestion they're using, we won't be able to more targetly, more effectively target our resources, which is what we need to do with this problem. So the, some of the challenges that we're experiencing at the federal level is the sheer number, the sheer number now over 500 new psychoactive substances that are identified make tracking the use of them very, very challenging. And the fact that these 500 don't all go by the same names is also, is also enormously significant. So a person can take metabolite X or substance X on a Saturday and it goes by one name in one community and the same person can take the same thing the next Saturday bought at the same store with under the same packaging, same label, and it's not necessarily the same substance, let alone the variations that we're seeing from region by region. The, Roots of ingestion vary significantly, 
And testing, as we know, is an enormous challenge. It's very, very expensive. Uh, we have traditional panels of, 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 uh, for drugs. Uh, and even when we add a few of these new psychoactive substances to try to get a handle on what populations are using and what they might be using, where do you start? How do you pick among the, among the 500 that have been identified? Where are you going to put your resources? It's, it makes the, the very basic information of, that we need in order to target our efforts and guide our policy initiatives very, very challenging. OK, but we do know, we do know some things. Um, we know, for example, from monitoring the future that Truly, if you're racking and stacking drugs in terms of use uh, based on the national and sort of federal surveys that we have, we know quite honestly that new psychoactive substances, broadly speaking nationally, are not the highest in terms of volume drugs of abuse that are, that are drugs of use that are, that are out there. We know that there are other drugs that are, that are used more frequently and more regularly. But, and I mentioned this, this is very important, I think, our national drug control efforts are not actually driven by particular drugs, and they're not driven by, by, the, by the number of people who are using the drugs. They're driven in part by the consequences uh, of, drugs, of, of the drugs themselves. And so even though new psychoactive substances, if I said you're kind of racking and stacking, <clears throat> excuse me, are not among the highest number in terms of use of drugs that are being abused in the United States, the consequences of their use are so terribly, terribly significant, that it's, we really do need to address them. So we know, and this is, this is good news, that when our Monitoring the Future survey first started to track, thank you, first started to track use, they were actually asking about synthetic cannabis. Um, <clears throat> and what they, what they found out was that in 2011, 11.4% of high school seniors, so 12th graders, were, uh, were reporting that they had used what they called synthetic cannabis at least once in that year. So fast forward to 2014, and that number is down to 5.8. So that's a very, very good thing on the surface, and it's really all the information that we have at this point about from this survey on, on these, this population. Um, but it's tricky in terms of what it really tells us, because all it really tells us is that a bunch of 12th graders reported that they had only used synthetic can cannabis spice once in that calendar year. What it doesn't tell us is what they think we mean by synthetic cannabis or any of the other 499 drugs that they may have noted on this survey if we had asked those questions. Of course, we can't ask questions about 499 different substances, all sort of NPS. So, as you, as you can see, this, this, the tracking bit is, is very challenging. Um, we also know, and this is good news, that, um, that among eighth graders as well, those reporting, um, reporting risk associated with, with, this, with these synthetic cannabinoids um, had, uh, had um, started out at 36.2% in 2013 and declined a little bit by 32.4. This is good. That means there's some messaging getting out there and, and, and they're, they're being educated about the dangers of this. However, uh, 12th graders were reporting, um, the, those reporting great risk in trying synthetic marijuana increased significantly from 25.9% to 32.5 over the same period. So this is also somewhat, um, somewhat good news. I am not thrilled, by the way, that we in our Monitoring the Future um, talk and ask questions about synthetic cannabis because I think that it, under, um, it undermines our efforts to really um, dispel this idea that these drugs are really mimicking the more traditional drugs that are being sold um, in the sort of illicit markets because while that might have been the case originally, we know and John can talk more about the kind of chemistry of all this, we know that we are far beyond that. And so letting the kids sort of think, or the young adults who might be using these drugs, think that what they're buying uh, in the stores or on the streets is really just a slightly better version or an enhanced version of marijuana or of cocaine or of an opioid is really a very dangerous, um, a very dangerous and, and risky proposition. Um,
Okay. So uh, just to sort of uh, give you different sort of pieces, which is all, which we were all seeing, it seems like, at the state, local, and federal level, different kind of pieces of, that's all coming together um, in terms of what's really going on with use. The American Association of Poison Control Centers is a great place to look for for information about what's going on with MPS because people have an adverse reaction and they call the poison control centers. So in 2011, they uh, had reported there were over almost 7,000 cases of the synthetic cannabinoids, calls associated with synthetic, synthetic cannabinoids, and, uh, and they were decreasing steadily, quite frankly, over the years until, we, until 2015. And as of August 2015, they've got more than 5,652 cases being reported, with over 2,700 cases reported in April and May alone. Uh, so clearly something significant is going on uh, in terms of use these days. Uh, just a couple more points um, uh, on, on use. Um, we, ONDCP, funded a pilot study back in um, 2013, the Community Drug Early Warning System, uh, it's called, and it was looking at uh, only synthetic cannabinoids. And it, what it found, and it was looking at, it was retesting urine samples in uh, criminal justice populations. And what it found actually was that if they went back and retested those samples, um, for the people who had tested positively, lo and behold, they also tested positively for synthetic cannabinoids. More interestingly almost is, for the, for the people who did not test positively, what they found is if they went back and retested those samples, they did test positively for the synthetic cannabinoid metabolites. And so, so, so that was sort of an interesting piece of the puzzle. They redid the study in 2015. They expanded some sites. They included some juvenile, so juveniles in the, in the, in the uh, testing as well. And what they found was uh, same stuff plus the more synthetic cannabinoids that they tested for, the more synthetic cannabinoids they found results positive for. Um, and, and additionally, and this I think is very, very significant, what they also found was it varied enormously from site to site. So in one site, there were a lot of positives that were being tested for the same metabolite, but in another site, they only had, um, they had a, a wide variety. We're doing the study again. Uh, we're in the process of, uh, of, of doing the study again. We're expanding. We're working actually now with Hawaii and, and, um, and the HOPE project. And we're also um, including emergency rooms, which is going to be very helpful. Um, I also wanted to mention quickly that the use rates are, are being tracked by the federal government um, through a community of scientists and government officials, public health people, uh, trying to track information about um, through also social media and news media, because frankly, we, like yourselves, are finding a lot about these sort of outbreaks and these occurrences, quite honestly, through, through the news, through news reporting. Okay, very briefly, uh, I want to give John a lot of time to talk about our efforts. So let me just say these are, these are very dangerous. These are not good drugs. They have some very, very significant consequences associated with them. And uh, these, this, these two points just talk about the synthetic cannabinoids and th synthetic cathinones alone. Um, I want to pause just for a sec on this slide to point out some of the obvious, which is that we have absolutely no idea what is going into these uh, packages, what's being sold uh, online and in, and in our, our um, stores, actually, because the... And we don't really know what the biological effects are of, of, of the vast majority of the things that are being sold. The end user can't really be sure specifically what's in the, what's in the package, what they're going to ingest. They can contain toxic impurities, they contain byproducts, they contain adulterants, which in and of themselves can be extraordinarily dangerous. And clearly the packaging is being mislabeled, uh, so you can't count on that either. Um, just to sort of wrap up, uh, we are doing a lot at the federal level in terms of uh, providing education and resources and doing a lot of research around these new psychoactive substances. The information that I have up on this side is for NIDA alone. DEA has an, an entire group of chemists and, uh, and scientists who are dedicated to this. ONDCP has a team, H other HHS agencies do as well. So this is just a drop in the bucket to sort of show you, uh, that's not the right sign. Oops. 
there we go, uh, a drop in the bucket to sort of show you some of the information that's available to very targeted audiences. So we've got, we've got things for the general public, we have things that are targeting teens, and we even have some, um, some information that's being provided to, to, younger, uh, to younger kids. Um, NIDA is also funding some very important research right now to, to kind of get a better understanding of the pharmacology of new psychoactive substances, and, and this, I think, is very, very important. They are also developing ultra-short-acting antagonists to help treat the very, very significant and toxic effects of some of these drugs that, are, that doctors are seeing in emergency rooms. Um, and actually, they're quite far along in the, in the research on this, and I think it's going to be very significant, not unlike naloxone, frankly, for op opioid overdoses. Um, yeah, there's also a lot of research kind of going on about um, to try to get a better understanding of, um, in the context of bath salts, kind of who's using and how the marketing is sort of working, uh, including uh, users' perceptions about health and safety risks. And this is all, again, about getting how we can use our resources more effectively and in a more targeted fashion. Importantly, they're also creating information um, and education tools to help doctors, because quite, quite honestly, a number in the medical community who are seeing people uh, who are having adverse uh, consequences associated with NPS, they're not really quite, they don't know all the time what it is that they're seeing. Um, and so helping them address that better is going to be very helpful. All right, I'm going to end on, uh, on two notes. One is that I mentioned the National Drug Control Strategy. We actually have a couple of action items in there that are dedicated to uh, improving the situation around NPS, reducing availability. We're going to continue in those efforts. One of the things that we do in our office, and, and the administrator actually of that program might be in the audience uh, today, um, is uh, we run a grant program. It's called the Drug-Free Communities Coalition uh, Program. We run it out of our office. It's actually managed out of the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. It's significant because for not a whole lot of dollars from the feds or local communities, local communities are able to affect some, some um, significant long-lasting change around the way the communities uh, deal with drugs um, at, at a very local level. Um, and, and I say that because it's, because what they're doing is not drug specific. They're not trying to reduce the number of uh, drug users in the community by sort of X percent. They're actually aiming at something far bigger and far grander. They're aiming at changing the environment around drugs in the community. And what I like about this program, aside from the fact that it's been proven to be effective, and there might be some folks in the audience actually who are DFC grantees, um, is that they, um, is that the framework, in order to be a grantee, you have to do exactly what your agenda is setting out to do today, which is that you have to collaborate across sectors. In order to get the grant money, you have to have uh, sitting at the table a commitment from public health, public safety, the clergy, the schools, the business community, the parents, the teachers. Everybody has to come together to work at this problem um, in a collaborative way, and that's really important and then I'm going to stop talking. It's really important because this, we have a lot of tools. We have a lot of tools and resources in the United States to address the drug problem, sort of writ large. And we're doing a great job in some areas. We need more, more work, frankly, done in, in sort of others. But the problem is, NPS is a challenge for all of us. We have these great tools to address some traditional problems. And they're, we're making use of them. And we're doing good work utilizing them for NPS. But NPS is so different. It is, they're frankly, they're a big, big problem. And I, and I think the way of the future is around NPS and just drug policy more broadly is not to be siloed in, not to sort of, if you're on the public health side, to look to the criminal justice community to fix this problem. We know that that's not a great solution. Or if you're in the criminal justice uh, community to sort of point over there to the researchers or to the treatment providers or to the federal government or to the local communities or to the store owners to make it their problem. This is a problem that is bigger than all of us. And, and like the drug-free communities framework and like your agenda today, this is gonna be solved by us reaching across the aisle past our comfort zones and all trying to work together uh, at every intervention point to, to address this.
All right, I could talk for a very long time about NPS. Sorry, John. I'm around uh, for questions and uh, the whole day, and I look forward to talking with you. Thank you for uh, really laying the groundwork for uh, the, the, the issue with NPS, or uh, I use that term interchangeably with, with synthetic designer drugs. NPS is often a, uh, a term used, uh, whether it be the federal government or really in the international community as to uh, drugs that are of concern that are not under international control. So they refer to those as NPS. I do uh, as well, new psychoactive substances, but also use the term synthetic designer drugs. Uh, I'll talk about uh, a little bit of how we see the drugs coming into the country, how they're processed. I'll talk about some of the drugs of concern in this region, although I'm sure uh, many of you are very aware of those types of drugs. And then I'll go into our national and international efforts as to uh, what we're doing at DEA with our, our uh, national counterparts, our uh, regional and, and local counterparts, and then also our international counterparts. We've got a wide range of experience in the room, but again, it's very important, I think, to, to kind of lay the groundwork and describe how these drugs are coming into the country and from start to finish, what does it look like? How do you get to a point where you've got a package of Scooby Snacks or Bizarro, whatever the case might be, with a, a plant-like material that's labeled not for human consumption? How does that get to uh, from point A to point B and what uh, we see in the United States? We'll talk about synthetic cannabinoids first. Uh, this is an example of the drug XLR11. Um, I know that there was a seizure recently here in the, in the district, uh, about uh, 19,000 packets of of the drug uh, that's uh, in the packaging, Bizarro. But this is what it looks like when it comes into the country. Um, it looks like really any other drug. That's a synthetic cannabinoid. That is a finished drug. Make no mistake, uh, that's coming in. It's got the psychoactive effects uh, of the drug. So when it comes in, you've got to take that powder and you've got to get it to a different form. So they'll mix it with uh, something like acetone and put it into a soluble uh, solution. Uh, and I know uh, Director Keenan mentioned PCP, and I kind of, you know, people like to compare this to marijuana, but when you look at it, when it comes in as a powder form, you mix it into a solution, and then you apply it on a plant-like material. Uh, PCP is often laced in cigarettes, it's in a solution, uh, and, or on plant material or marijuana. So Again, you see some similarities there when it comes to how these drugs come in or how these drugs are uh, laced on plant material. So you take that powder uh, and it's in that acetone solution and then you mix it uh, with a plant material. The plant material is often called Damiana leaf, um, also marshmallow leaf. All of that is is a ground up plant uh, generally that comes in from, uh, we, we see a lot of that coming in from Mexico or uh, Europe. And then they take that and we've seen them mix in cement mixers as the picture depicts, um, and then dump it out uh, on a warehouse floor uh, to dry and let the acetone evaporate. And then what you're left with is that synthetic cannabinoid laced on the plant material. This is another example, probably one of the more sophisticated ones in the, in the United States where they're putting the, uh, the drug onto the plant material, um, but again in a warehouse and uh, if you would think that there's any type of quality control uh, for those people that are putting these types of drugs on the, uh, the plant material, um, we're, we're sorely mistaken. Then it goes to, it could be a packaging center, it could be a different part of the warehouse and they'll package it, whether it be in Bizarro packages or Mr. Happy or Scooby Snacks or whatever the case might be. And again, uh, not very uh, clean conditions, but um, you know, this is where they package the stuff. Those are some of the more sophisticated ones, but it doesn't have to be like that. We're encountering them in people's garages. This was in someone's shed, they've got the, uh, the synthetic cannabinoid on the plant material in that plastic um, Tupperware type bin on the counter. We see it in people's garages uh, where they're placing the uh, plant material on uh, the drug on the plant material. Their basements, uh, mixing it with KitchenAid mixers in this instance. Again, a warehouse. 
but they end up in uh, convenience stores, gas stations, online. Uh, we've got instances where people are buying it from bait shops. Again, any kind of retail environment. Uh, we've seen a little bit of a, uh, this, uh, this type of drug being sold behind counters, moved uh, out of public view, so it's not readily accessible to law enforcement or others that are looking for this type of drug. But again, if uh, the right customer comes in there, uh, many of these stores will, will reach under the cabinet and sell to that person. Christine mentioned uh, about uh, inconsistencies in product and one day you could have something in a, uh, a synthetic cannabinoid of JWH-122, uh, AWAM-2201 and then uh, shortly thereafter you'll have something else and that's what these uh, results show. Um, again, uh, we're finding that uh, one day it could be one thing, and the next day it could be something else. The other thing that we're finding is multiple drugs on, in the same packet. Uh, the top one has two different drugs in it, AM2201 and JWH122. Uh, but we found that there's been up to five separate types of synthetic cannabinoids and sometimes uh, a synthetic cathinone mixed into it as well which uh, adds to uh, the, um, the hazards and the dangers to these types of products. I'm not a scientist, but uh, what this slide depicts is that, uh, again, about the inconsistencies of how a product is put together. Uh, we'll often test uh, one package and divide it into four separate areas and you'll get four different concentrations of a drug. You might have somebody go out and buy a package of Scooby Snacks and share it with a friend. Uh, one person could have a severe adverse reaction and the other person may not. And again, this could be from the standpoint that the drugs uh, might have different concentrations uh, on it. And again, going back to the people that are putting these types of drugs together, um, they're, they don't have that scientific background. It's, you know, again, people working in their basements or garages uh, and, uh, again, adding to the hazards. <coughs> We're finding uh, the synthetic cannabinoids in e-cigarettes and vape pens as well, um, which adds to the, the dangers. This was an example uh, that took place in Buffalo, New York. Uh, the synthetic cannabinoid was AB Panaka in a solution that was used in um, a, a vapor pen, a vape pen. Again, additional examples of the, uh, the synthetic cannabinoid as liquid incense, but again, that's to be used uh, to be smoked in e-cigarettes. It's important to mention synthetic uh, cathinones, and uh, there are uh, examples of seizures of synthetic cathinones in, in the DMV here. Um, what these are, they're central nervous system stimulants, and drugs that are similar like amphetamine or methamphetamine, MDMA type properties. Um, we, uh, when these first kind of came onto the market, they were sold as bath salts, but we've seen kind of a transformation that these types of drugs have moved more into the underground market and are being sold as molly and flaca, and probably many people have experienced um, the people that have purchased or have been on the drug molly. It kind of leads us to the question, well, what is molly? And you know, we had an idea maybe about 10 or 15 years ago what Molly was. It was something that people believed was the pure form of MDMA or ecstasy. But these days, it can really be any synthetic cathinone that mimics the effects of ecstasy. Some of the drugs that we've encountered in Molly have been obviously MDMA and the dates next to it depict when they were scheduled. MDMA was scheduled in 1985. Methylone, uh, we scheduled it, we temporarily scheduled that in October of 2011. Alpha PVP, 4 methyl ethylcathinone, pentadrone, butylone, ethylone. And again, these are names of drugs that uh, are part of that list of 500 that uh, Christine mentioned uh, that the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime had, uh, had identified, although we identified them here in the United States through many different means, and uh, I'll talk about that uh, shortly. Um, 
uh, again, this was an example that I'd found that was took place up in uh, a college up in New Hampshire, I believe, or actually Connecticut. But I know there have been adverse health effects and re uh, reactions to the drug uh, Molly here in Washington, D.C., uh, back in, I believe, a year or so ago, uh, resulted in some overdose deaths uh, as well. But again, when you talk about what's in a drug called Molly, uh, down there at the bottom, I've got some of my colleagues from headquarters here that uh, I'll introduce them in a minute, but these are more in their lane than they are mine. But uh, again, you've got phenethylamines, drugs that are uh, uh, designed to give you hallucinations, 6-MAPB, uh, AB Fubinaca, uh, melatonin, that's a, a vitamin, but Xanax is an alprazolam, an anti-anxiety uh, medication. So again, when someone says, I took a Molly, uh, you're not going to know what it is until you have it specifically tested. Flaca, uh, I haven't necessarily heard a whole lot of that here in this area. However, it's, it's big in, uh, um, in, in Florida and it's spreading. And I, you know, like I said, I looked forward to hearing some people probably after the, uh, the, the presentation this morning about are there encounters of uh, alpha PVP here. All right, I'm running. Acetyl fentanyl is a synthetic opioid. I'm going to kind of pop through a couple of these, uh, but we're concerned about the synthetic opioids due to the, uh, the overdoses. It's in combination with the heroin problem that we're having in the United States. We're finding a lot of heroin mixed with opioid, uh, synthetic opioids, fentanyl or acetyl fentanyl. Counterfeit pills, uh, we're seeing the fentanyl and fentanyl analogs or pills containing heroin in them. Um, the, the opioid uh, acetyl fentanyl we found on blotter paper, like you might take uh, LSD. Kind of our efforts to reduce uh, you know, manufacturing and availability. And uh, I've, I've got two colleagues from our drug chemical and evaluation section here. And it was mentioned, they're the ones that collect the data from throughout the United States, and they might reach out to you or your department or your health area to, to collect the harms that are occurring. Um, and they're the ones that do the temporary scheduling at the federal level through DEA. Uh, very important part uh, with their involvement. I'll go down to the May 2013 XLR11 uh, scheduling. We scheduled uh, three synthetic cannabinoids. Uh, one thing that that kind of relates to what's going on here is that drug in the recent seizure, it's been reported that the drug on that was XLR11 in the Bizarro packets. So the good thing is that that's already a Schedule One controlled substance. Uh, the Controlled Substance Analog Act is used extensively in going after those that are selling these types of products, the ones that are not controlled, the NPS, the ones that are not under control in the United States. It's, it's effective, but it's very cumbersome and very difficult. It's labor intensive, and it involves a lot of uh, expert witnesses from drug scientists to, uh, to utilize this statute. I want to talk about uh, some in, uh, national kind of takedowns and just to show the scope, and I probably don't need to kind of describe the scope of that. During one of the operations that took place, uh, uh, back in July of 2012, and the reason I'm going back to that one is because we actually counted each and every packet that was seized as part of that operation. There were over 300 search warrants that took place nationwide. 4.8 packets, 4.8 million packets of these uh, synthetic cannabinoids were seized, such as this. Um, but I wanted to put a dollar sign to it just to show the magnitude of uh, how much money is being generated by the sales of these. Um, uh, that 4.8 million packets, just if you said that was a $10 per packet, you would have $48 million. So again, the amount of money generated is significant. Um, and if you add it all up, uh, the, the total value would be over $116 million just for the synthetic cannabinoids alone. We've had uh, co corporate outreach and really working with ONDCP, um, who has arranged some of these meetings. Uh, met with MasterCard, Visa, PayPal, eBay, and kind of gave them a briefing on uh, these drugs and how their payment processing cards are being used to purchase these types of drugs online. Um, uh, we did a convenience store outreach through DEA, sent a letter to the top 100 convenience stores describing the dangers of synthetic designer drugs. 
and that's something that may be able to be employed in, in this area. And I've got an example of the letter that went out uh, that was signed by our deputy director at, at DEA. Um, again, this went to like the national kind of convenience stores. And uh, while, while I think they're good at putting the messaging out, we're seeing the mom and pop stores that, that don't have any affiliation with really the, the corporate industry that, that would kind of care to, to uh, address the issue from a corporate standpoint. Um, and I th I'm winding down here. Our international efforts, we do a lot of work with obviously, uh, with, which was mentioned before with the United Nations Office in Drugs and Crime. Um, again, uh, I think it's been reported that more than 90 countries are uh, experiencing a problem with synthetic designer drugs or NPS. Uh, our unit, uh, the Drug Chemical and Evaluation Unit, provides a tremendous amount of data and information to the uh, international scheduling efforts of the World Health Organization. Uh, last year, I believe they scheduled 11 of these substances. Again, it's a drop in the hat, but it's again raising awareness through the drug scheduling at the international level. We work with the International Narcotics Control Board. We have a meeting with them in, in uh, December. Uh, we've got an upcoming bilateral meeting, and we have multilateral meetings with China to address the issues. Uh, one thing that took place, China scheduled about, uh, I think, 11 of these substances January 1st of 2014. That had an immediate impact on what was available uh, here in the United States. They scheduled a drug called methylone. Well, what the chemist did was just move on to a different drug called ethylone. And so, again, our efforts with China is, uh, is ongoing in, in that. Um, again, I think uh, we need to continue our efforts to target those that are selling these in our communities through whatever method uh, or means that we can, whether it be enforcement actions, uh, letters from uh, law enforcement or, or community, uh, working with our community leaders to, uh, to do that. I, I won't discuss this because I think I'm out of time. Again, uh, Christine mentioned re reaching across the aisles and, and really addressing this issue with any and every uh, uh, available resource that we have is so very important.